Ella Kemp um, and you are watching Enemy and today we are here with Kate Nash. Hello Kate. Hi. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing well thanks. How are you doing? I am very well thank you. Um, better now and I kind of wish that I was wearing rabbit ears as well. I kind of wish them over this. <laughs> but, I'll hook you up. I'll send you some. Thank you. Please do. <laughs> Um, your rabbit ears are also to celebrate your new single, Misery, is that right? Yeah, they are. Uh, do you like when I nod my head, they kind of flop around. I mean, I'm wearing, I, I, I'm wearing bunny ears in the video. I've always been into bunnies. I actually, um, my, my bunny rabbit, Fluffy, just died this year and she was 12 years old. Um, and she was also used as the artwork on my second record, My Best Friend Is You. The pandemic has definitely given me so much perspective and it's it's like the least stressed I felt putting out music because I think we all really know what's real stress now. Yeah. And putting out music is really fun and it makes me happy and it's like a nice contribution. It kind of feels like last year I was really depressed and sort of useless. And then I had to kind of find my way and figure out how I could be a musician in, in this pandemic. And then I figured that out. And now I'm like, oh, I can kind of contribute again and like give people music, which is like a nice thing to give people. <laughs> Amazing. So, so Misery lyrically kind of deals with all those feelings, as you were saying, like the kind of the totality of lockdown in um, like the, the, the depression of it, really. Yeah. Um, yeah. How does it feel to be releasing it now in what kind of feels like a bit more of a hopeful time? Like, yeah. you know, we kind of we can kind of see the light at the end of the tunnel. Was that had you been holding it back for a while? What, what was the kind of timeline with it? I think I just was like writing, recording more music and um, figuring out like the best time to start releasing. Um, I'm also doing a tour called the Safely Out of the Bedroom Tour, which is I'm like traveling around so, you know, I, 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 can't, I was like, I can't do what I do. So how do I have a job? You know, Glow got cancelled, touring's cancelled, venues are closed. It's not a good time to sign to labels, all that stuff. And I was like, how do I do this? How do I kind of reinvent again? And um, I was doing Patreon and loving that community. And then I was like, OK, I'm going to go on tour. I was also doing camping trips with my boyfriend because it was a way to get away safely completely COVID safe, just the two of us like going to the woods and camping. I mean, it's safe. And so I was like, maybe I can combine this because live streaming from my bedroom and living room is charming, but very dull. And part of putting on a show is putting on a show and having people experience some kind of escapism. And so I thought, um, and also I just think like the nature of touring, it's so crazy to travel around with instruments and people and expect it all to happen every night. And somehow it does. And there's like the hijinks of travel and things going wrong. I just feel like it's like everybody's involved in that journey in a weird too way. too easy at home, right? In your living room. Yeah, exactly. It's like, you, it's too easy. And also a little bit rubbish. So, <laughs> so I was like, what about combining this idea of going, I, I, I live in America, I live in California and one of my favorite things about living in California is like the wilderness that's at my doorstep and get national parks and forests and like these grand landscapes. And so I just thought, what if that was my backdrop instead of this? And that's more interesting and fun. And then I can kind of take people on the road through Patreon and make this and make this mini documentary series on my Patreon. And, and it's really fun. And it actually worked in terms of us all feeling like we're on this little journey together um, and I wouldn't be able to be doing it without my patrons so I just love that community um, and yeah it was just kind of getting that stuff together and deciding the right time to release Misery and and to be honest I still go in and out of bouts of depression it's it's there is light at the end of the tunnel but then I think we're all a bit scared that it's all going to go wrong again and yeah. it's not quite to me I'm I haven't seen my family yet and I think like I'll feel so healed when I get to come home and see my family. But there's just like a lot of things about the reality of that, that I'm like working out. And um, I think this summer I'll be able to, to come home and see them. In a similar vein to Misery, which, because it feels like quite a bittersweet track. Like if you didn't listen to the lyrics at all, you'd be like, this is a great time. We're having great fun. Yeah. Is that the kind of energy <laughs> you're you're going for kind of on the new, on the new music you're working on? Yeah, I, I, I really leaned into the lacklustre, lethargic, depression stuff I think sometimes I have a thing where I, I I'm an overthinker and I have to work things out 
And, and so when the lockdown happened, I was like, oh, I can't, I'm depressed. I can't do anything. And like, what does that mean? Am I even an artist? Like, like, like it was like day three of lockdown and I was like having an existential crisis, which is like very me. I feel like that happens to me the day I get home from tour. I'm like, what do I do now? I'm no one, I have no purpose. <laughs> and I think it's kind of a common thing with artists and musicians. Um, it's like constantly searching for purpose. And, mm. and, and when you're, you know, I think for a lot of musicians, our identity was taken away because we pride ourselves on touring and we pride ourselves on this like nomadic lifestyle in a way. And it's such a part of your, who you are that not being able to do it, it almost is like, oh God, well now I just come home and, and who am I at home? Who yeah. am I here in these walls? And without that thing that I feel is just me, you know, if that's not possible again, who is that? Who am I? Mm. And I've kind of experienced that before, you know, when I, all my money was stolen <clears throat> from my manager, which is covered in my documentary, I, and I was sort of felt a bit like washed up and dried up and and then and I uh, was dealing with all those feelings I feel like I had to uh, confront that again so it reminded me of that in a way going through lockdown um it's never a bad thing to to you know to be able to come back to yourself and and mm. not need other things to like make you who you are if that makes sense almost feeling like I couldn't do what I did anymore made me so grateful to do it yeah. I have this, this good example of that, like I went to see Elton John at the Staples Center and it was so good and he loves playing live, like after every single song he slams down the piano and walks around and like gets the audience to like give him more applause, <laughs> literally <laughs> after every song, like how someone would act at the end of a gig, he's like every time so like, give me more. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, I love how much Elton loves this. And you could see with his musicians, they were just having such a good time. And it was so cool. And then I had this gig in Guildford at this like small venue, you know, 200 cap sweaty room. And I remember looking around and I was like, I'm feeling what Elton's feeling right now. And I was like conscious of it. And we were just having the best show. And I remember thinking like, if you think that you're going to get what Elton feels at the Staples Center, you'll you'll never get it like you that will feel really empty like I've played that Hammersmith Apollo sold out and felt really empty because of like other things that were going on and where I was but like with where I am with my band like the bond that I formed like how I've grown as a performer I do a 200 cap room and like I know me and Elton have got that same zing we cannot measure success in the same way um I remember I really remember this vividly like Katy Perry's album um Prism, when that came out, that was when the industry started like shifting how they talked about pop stars. And I remember everyone being like, oh, the record's just not performing. You know, it's just, she's not doing as well. And I was like, if Katy Perry's not doing as well, no one's doing as well. Like Katy Perry is Katy Perry. Katy Perry is doing really well. <laughs> and she can do whatever she wants. And like, just because we can't like measure her record sales the same way we could Teenage Dream, doesn't matter because we're in a completely different landscape and people are consuming pop stars in a completely different way mm. and music in a completely different way. So like, I think just like not measuring our stuff, like it's impossible to measure your success in this day and age, I think. Yeah, well, so kind of thinking of how much the landscape has changed, um, I'm really curious to know your thoughts on a conversation which, which did emerge online last year, um, which was about landfill indie, kind of looking at bands around like 2008, the likes of maybe the Kooks and the Fratellis and Razorlight and things like that. What are your thoughts on that kind of quote unquote term of landfill indie? Landfill indie, oh my God, I missed that conversation. It's funny because it feels like that's again, like being like, oh, the Kooks aren't relevant, but they have mass, they play massive shows. Like mm -hmm. I actually played that festival that they do in Finsbury Park a couple of years ago. And it was so amazing. It was like a huge festival. And like when the kooks came on, like young people as well, like it wasn't just people in their thirties who like grew up with the kooks. Like I was with a photo photographer who's like 20 something. And he was like, oh my God, the kooks, like so excited to see them play. So I think again, it's like a really uh, difficult thing to like, yeah, maybe the kooks aren't being talked about on like what pop world, but pop world doesn't exist. Like T4 doesn't exist anymore. So like those places where maybe those bands would be being talked about don't exist, but the fans are still there and going to their shows and like loving their music. And they have been like consistently touring since they were like, you know, what's hot right now. And and I, I really admire that. And I think that's like, that's how I kind of see myself. It's like, yeah, I'm not like Kate Nash 2007 getting packed 
but like I still have a fan base and I'm still putting out records and still playing shows like be proud of what you do and like do what you believe in so that no matter what you can stand by it mm -hmm. those last values sound very much like the mantras of glow which I adored um, exactly. and so many people did and still do um it it came as such a shock to all of us the news of the cancellation um I mean <sighs> How, how, how did you feel about it at the time? How do you feel about it? And please, please tell me that there are any conversations happening among cast and crew about oh. a film, a return. Can you tell us anything hopeful about that? I can't. <laughs> I'm re I, I, I can't tell you anything hopeful. I have a feeling there's this like, I mean, Frasier's coming back. Frasier mm -hmm. is coming back. So like, it's never, completely end maybe these days. I feel like when we're in our 50s and 60s, there'll be like a glow movie. You and they'll just be like- wait that long? I think, yeah. I bet like when we're in our 50s, they'll be like, we're gonna do a glow movie, put your leotards on ladies. And we'll be like, oh Jesus, like being <laughs> slammed and broken in the ring. Like <laughs> apart from Alison Brie, he'll still be like completely perfect and incredible and like a machine. Like she'll just still you be killing You all will. Him. That's why the show was always amazing from the start. I mean, it was devastating. Like it was, it was, it was, I think I felt a bit numb at the time because it was one of those moments where it's like, it's hard to give yourself the, uh, the feelings because everyone was going through so much. Like- Did you have much warning before it went public? No, we had like a day. Wow. We were, I think we were actually told it's not going to go public until this day. And then it was like public an hour after. And we were like, no! <laughs> it was like when you, if you like break up with someone and you like have an agreement about how you can handle it. And then they just like post that they're single and you're just, they like change their Facebook status update. And you're like, no, what the hell, what the hell? We were really sad. Uh, we had scripts, we had started shooting. We were shooting episode two. That show meant so much to so many of us. Um, I love Glow. I, it's like my ideal, perfect role that I got cast in. To be in a show of a collaboration of freakish women, misfits, trying to make it happen. I just love that story. Working with those women saved me. It like My confidence was in the gutter after everything I'd been through with music. And it was reinstalled in a wrestling ring with 15 female comedians and Chavo Guerrero. Um, and like you, that, uh, that experience can never be like, I, I could never recreate it. I could never replace that. That was like one of the best golden, most exquisite experiences of my life. I was going to be a mermaid in season four. My wrestling character was a mermaid. I would learn how to do the worm and I was going to like worm around the ring in a comedic style and like hit people with my tail. I was so excited and I'm so heartbroken. Um, and yeah, it's just like, like a, like a lot of people, it's just like, mm -hmm. I lost that, I lost my job. Like that really sucked. And you have to kind of let yourself feel the feelings and then try to move on. Do you know what? Maybe I'll actually just become a wrestler. Like maybe I'll just do that. Could when that the pandemic be something like with the, with your Patreons that kind of comes back <laughs> into, I don't know, part of the tour, part of the new music. Yeah. When we can get back to like touring, because touring is going to be so overbooked and backed up. I won't tour, I'll do wrestling. I'll do wrestling shows. And my friend, Alicia Taylor, who works at WWE, who used to be my drummer, she's actually casting for wrestlers. So she's trying to get me in NXT anyway. So maybe I'll just do that. There you go. So roughly 14 months ago, uh, you covered Metallica's uh, Enter Sandman on a... <laughs> um, have you had any feedback from them? Have you heard anything? Have they checked in? I haven't had anything from them, but maybe you could like tag them in this interview or something sure. and be like, I'd love to know what they think. And yeah, I would love I mean, them to go down to cloud. You want to say to them, is there anything they need to know for context about the cover? Why yes, so, uh, the tin whistle was my first instrument. I'm Irish and I grew up playing tin whistle, playing Varon and Irish dancing. And, you know, I've been playing a few tunes and I learned cover their song and I would be so happy to put Tim Whistle on any new music that they're working on. I even imagine just like those vocals with like just Tim Whistle, how about that? Mm -hmm. How about just do something totally different and daring? I'm in. Cool. And available, available on Zoom anytime. Amazing. 
Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for Thank missing. You. Thank you for oh. the tip whistle. And I hope we'll see you very soon at one of the COVID safe gigs on the road. Yes, and more music to come, more music to come. Amazing.